what's been on my heart is uh, 1 Samuel 30 has been speaking to me a lot uh, and I'm just going to speak from that this morning in the, the, the little bit of time that we have. Uh, I'm just going to keep it to about 20 minutes so the kids can get on with their activities. But if you want to look it up, I think it'd be helpful to read at least some of the passage, uh, although uh, sometimes doing that takes up time, I think, reading the passage, because it's a story of David uh, and, uh, and his followers and uh, them getting into a really, really difficult situation together. Um, and, and so if you want to turn there, uh, the, the title of this morning really is to, how to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. How to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. So a, a, a thermometer is something that you use to, that tells you the temperature, whereas a thermostat is something that sets the temperature. So, that, you know, most of us have got thermostats in our houses and it gets a bit cold. We turn the thermostat up, that brings the heating up and changes the temperature of the house. A thermometer will just tell you how hot, cold, or otherwise it is. And actually, we're called to be thermostats as believers. We're people who don't just read the temperature. That's useful to know, but actually change the temperature both in our own lives and those around us. And, and this story is, is an amazing example of that. So if you want to dive in there with me, I'm just going to read a little bit of this story. Uh, I'll give you a bit of background. David has been chased around by Saul. So David's called to be king. He's called and anointed to be king of Israel. The current king is very insecure and, and Saul, start, the king, starts chasing him around. So David's hiding in caves. But bit by bit, he gathers this, this community of people around him. There's about 600 men plus women and children and belongings. And they make their, their, they make their home in Ziklag, which is like really an enemy territory and to sort of protect himself from Saul, he kind of sides with the, with the Philistines, who are the, the, the is, Israel's enemy, uh, and even volunteers to fight with them. But they send him home, saying, no, we don't trust you. you know, it's great that you're with us, but we don't trust you to fight with us. So go home to Ziklag. And this, as he, when him and his 600 men get back to Ziklag, this is what he finds in verse 3. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until there was, they had no more strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahonoam, I don't know if you say that, of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength or strengthened himself, depends which translation, David strengthened himself in the, his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party, party, and will I overtake it? Pursue them, he answered, you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David and the 600 men with him came to the the Bezar ravine where some stayed behind for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine but David and the 400 men continued the pursuit they found an Egyptian who told them which way to go and then verse 13 um, to whom do you belong and he says he's an Egyptian and, and, and verse 15 he leads them down uh, and verse 16 he went down and you could see this raiding party scattered over the countryside eating drinking and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines. And then David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. So nearly a 24-hour battle ensues. None of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder, or anything else that they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds and his men drove them ahead of their livestock saying, this is David's plunder. So, I mean, they pursued this raiding party, uh, which was obviously a lot larger than them. There was 400 of them fled, and, but 400 of David's men conquered this raiding party and got everything back. And, and the story... Um, uh, maybe David, David is someone that I, certainly I aspire to be like. I think we all do. When you read the summary of David in the scripture, it says that he was a, he was a man after God's heart. There's a lovely bit, that summary of his life, where it says that he was Israel's singer 
of songs and we know what a worshipper he was from from just reading reading the psalms themselves and i know all of us long to be more and more after god so what that means is that our priorities are his priorities we share his passions we share his his affections for things and that really was what david's heart was all about so there's something here for all of us obviously he's a leader of this group but all of us are leading we're in some way or other we're leading our families we're leading ourselves we're maybe leading a small group we're leading in our places of work and, and actually all of us are positioned where we can influence the place that we are working where we are uh, learning you know if we're a student where we're, where we're learning so there's something in here for all of us although it's spoken to me quite a lot as a leader there's some all of us are involved in a wanting to have a heart like david and b wanting to lead ourselves our families and our environments so they are they are as they return to this place they are not doing well it says that they are weeping because of their loss their families have gone there wives, their children, all their goods have been completely plundered. They, and these men come back to devastation. Um, and they're so upset. It says that they're bitter in spirit that even their, their, the leader that they seem to have followed around the desert and have been persecuted with, even that leader, they, 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 they're threatening him with death. They say, David, what they're saying is you've led us to this point and you've led us into a right pickle here. This is a terrible mess. We are so distraught at this loss. I think we should get rid of you as well. And so David is also dealing with his own loss. He's in pain because his family's gone. His stuff has gone. His kids have gone. His wives have gone. And now his men are going, we're going to stone you. What does he do? What would you do at that moment? <laughs> the, the mood in the camp is not great. And, uh, Here's some of the options. I mean, he could he could try and discuss and reason with them and try and persuade them. Could try and commiserate a little bit and you know get get very empathetic with them about the whole situation, saying you know I've lost two. I mean, he could do that. He could run away. He could resign. I mean, he could. Although he's got this incredible word from God on his life and the prophet Samuel anointed him uh, and, and and gave him this incredible call to be king. You know, he's actually gone through quite a lot of difficulty even before now, tests and trials. And this is possibly the most the most massive one that he's faced with his own men even being turning against him and the loss of everything. It could be that he just interpreted it as, you know what, maybe I've got the call wrong. Maybe that promise is just, maybe I'm just getting ahead of myself. Maybe I'm just expecting too much from God. And this is this is a sign that that really I, I, I'm, uh, I should stop believing this promise right now because everything's pointing, every circumstance is pointing against this being the truth. So he could he just could resign himself, he could run away, he could just think, well, maybe I was deceived, maybe I was just expecting too much. Um, I don't know what you and I would have done right then, maybe it's worth thinking about it, but so much is going against him. Um, but actually, what he, he doesn't seem to try and deal either with his own pain in this moment or the pain of the people around him, although tender hearted people would be drawn to trying to do something about that. He, he, he doesn't. He, it's got this incredible phrase where it says, David finds strength, or David strengthens himself in the Lord his God. He finds courage in God. And then he inquires of the priest and they get the ephod. And this is the way that they had of basically getting, if you like, getting a prophetic word, getting what's God saying. So he, he somehow conquers his mood because it says that he's distraught as well and who wouldn't be, but he somehow gets a grip of his mood by encouraging himself in God and then turns to the source of hearing God in the situation and really says, well, God, what's your opinion? Everybody here is wanting me dead. Everybody here is just feeling so defeated. Everybody here says they're actually exhausted with weeping. And instead of letting that mood overtake him, both his mood and the mood around him, and that therefore deciding their future and their destinies, David does this really important thing, which is he encourages 
himself in God. He gets above and beyond how he's feeling for really good reasons and gets in a place where he can hear what the Lord is saying. Um, I, I mean, I, I did wonder, what would it be like if you did a church health survey at this moment? You know, <laughs> what would the results be if you did that from David and his men? It, it wouldn't come out too well, would it? And so he, he in this process, he, he, it's obvious what the climate is, but he doesn't act at this moment. He doesn't act as a thermometer because of the choices he's making internally he becomes a thermostat. He sets a new temperature for this situation. And here's some some tips from this story on how to be a a good thermostat. Number one, reading the community morale isn't the best guide to hearing God. Now, some of us, and I'm I'm one of these people, and I know many people are quite sensitive to moods and atmospheres And that can be a really good gift as long as it doesn't become the thing that sets your mood, sets your tempo, or dictates the direction you think God is taking you and the group in. I'm just going to say that again. So being aware of the mood is useful. So taking the temperature, but that's never meant to be the thing that we use as the thing that directs us. It doesn't set our mood or our tempo or our direction. It isn't necessarily what God is saying. It's just a measurement. It's not the measurement. So reading is useful, but it's not the final decision. If you and I want to be those who create temperature, who who are who are thermostats, then we can't afford to be overrun by the current temperature. We can't let that be the thing that sets our temperature. We have to be able to step beyond that in order to set a new temperature. Number two is It's possible for one person who gets encouraged and hears God to sway the mood of the crowd. And so democracy and heaven coming to earth don't really fit. So the mood is understandable, but it's not the final word by any sense. And actually one person who gets galvanized, who gets courage from God, who hears God, then suddenly changes the mood for the whole camp. So I think this is an incredible example of a mood change, of a mood switch that happens here. Just in a few moments, it goes from they're wanting to stone him, they're exhausted through weeping, to at least we know 600 of them go with him and 200 are still too tired to to keep pursuing these people. So, But 400 of them are. So what you can say is one man getting galvanized, hearing the Lord, getting encouraged, actually shifts the mood and brings energy to 400 men. And they're able not just to pursue the raiding party, but battle with them from the dusk of one night till, till the next day. It sounds like they do a night and a day's battle. Somehow, this mood shift that David managed to engage with affects the whole community and they are energized having been exhausted. Isn't that amazing? So your, your mood uh, can affect everybody around you. Suddenly you gain, and I gain courage and encouragement can actually breed encouragement and courage in other people because we, we're not allowing ourselves just to, our temperature to be set by the temperature that's around us. We set a new temperature. I found this in Proverbs in the Passion Translation. I thought it was really interesting. The way he puts it, everything seems to go wrong when you feel weak and depressed. Uh, and, and, and it is like that when you get, I know when you get in that sort of state of mind, it, it sort of breeds the next thing. But what David did was broke out of it and started to lead them in back into success rather than into this sense and, and momentum of discouragement. So number three is circumstances aren't the best measure of whether you heard God or not, I really touched on this already, but delays, defeats, setbacks are not necessarily a measure of how accurately you heard God, whether that promise that he gave you was true. The truth is every promise that you receive from God actually gets tested. There's tons of this in the Bible. James 1 is probably the, a great place to go, but it encourages us to rejoice when we meet various top trials because of the testing of our faith. The idea of a promise is it produces faith, but that faith can be tested. But God uses that testing 
not to break us, but to make us. Tests aren't there to break you. They're there to make you. They're there to produce patience and endurance and actually deepen and enlarge our faith. The good, the good purposes that God has for your life will mean more of heaven is invading the earth. And the enemy doesn't want to do that. So he is going to resist you. What's fascinating, if you read the next couple of chapters, it gets into the first chapter of 2 Samuel. What you realize is as David overcomes this massive setback, almost in that same frame of time, Saul is dying on a battlefield. And as David raises himself in courage and believes God for his purpose, he doesn't let himself be set back. The door swings open. A messenger comes to David literally three days he, after three days after this event. He arrives with David and says, Saul is gone. Here's the crown. And the door is open for David to step into the very purpose that is being challenged by this very uh, difficult situation. So you need to hear that. I think Chris Barton puts it this way, that the, the, the dogs of doom bark loudest at the door of destiny. The bit that you're meant to step into is often the point of which you can get the most difficult and challenging test. That's the moment to encourage yourself in the Lord. Um, so what, how can we do this? What, what are, are there some, oh, I've got one more point. I'm just about got time, I think. The, the point is that leadership, just to, for all of us, is it, it's this fascinating leadership for me here because rather than, get everybody healed up at this point, what changes them and changes how they're feeling about life is re-engaging with vision and purpose. And I think that's really important for those of us that lead is helping people re-engage with vision and purpose, what God put us on the planet for, the breakthrough he's called us to, getting re-galvanized towards that changes your mood. Getting on track with the purpose of God changes your mood. All right, I've got a uh, last point really is practically what, what you see here is we have responsibility for our mood. We actually, it says he encouraged himself. Let's not become passive. In order to be a thermostat, it requires us not to be passive about how we feel and what's going on around us, but actually to find courage, to get courage, to get encouraged in God. And here's, here's five things you can do in closing so that you can uh, encourage yourself in the Lord. Number one, worship. We just did that. It was amazing. It actually says of Abraham, even when it, all hope was lost, it says in hope against hope, he believed God. And it actually says he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. You can actually get more faith from God as you worship, even as you wait. Really important. And the depth of our worship is increased as we engage with the depth of our opposition. So it's not that we're saying or denying how we feel. It's saying, here it is, but I worship you anyway. And we lift our arms and we lift our voices and we say, yes, there's pain, but God, I think you're amazing and I worship you. As, as we kind of match the pain with the praise, something shifts. Worship is a real key to uh, encouraging yourself in God. Number two, find, find the Psalms. David wrote many of those Psalms. Find your voice in the Psalms. Find out they're real they're full of of how people are feeling find out uh, find a psalm that echoes where you are and use it uh, as something to encourage yourself with number three is remember your prophetic words fight with them paul says to Sim timothy he says to to wage a good war warfare to to remember the words timothy and wage a good warfare with those prophecies that's 1 timothy 1 18 Make a list of your prophecies, speak them out, remind God of them, remind yourself of them. That's a good way to encourage yourself. Don't let your circumstances delete your prophecies. Let your prophecies delete and change your circumstances. Number four, remember the miracles and the good things you've all already seen. I'm constantly amazed in the Gospels how Jesus is expecting the disciples to have learned from the miracles they've seen in order to be prepared for the challenge they're now in. And sometimes I know my experience and we look at stuff like that and I find myself, uh, I'm experiencing miracles as like I'm watching TV, but actually they've got nutrients for our faith for the next thing that we're going to see. So remember the most recent, remember the miracles, stir yourself up, that'll encourage you for the challenge. And, and fifthly, 
speak in tongues. It's something we forget to do, and yet it says, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, he speaks in tongues, edifies himself. So, Heavenly Father, I'm just going to pray for us all that we would increasingly be thermostats and, and not, th not just thermometers. God, I thank you for all of us who, who sense moods and all that. It's all great, but I pray increasingly we would know how to change our mood and change the mood around us, that we, we do carry heaven and we do bring it to earth and, and we do carry promises and we will see them come to pass. And we do have prophetic words and they are, they are rich and they are powerful and we can war with them. I thank you, Father, that each one of us has a purpose and each one of us both, to, well, actually together as a community, we have a purpose and you're going to lead us into it in these days. Amen.